Daniel chapter number two. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he dreamed dreams. They tell me in science that your dream, if you live an average life of 75 to 80 years old, you'll spend six years dreaming. Wow. I don't know how many of those you remember, but dreams can be interesting, right? <laughs> You ever dreamed of playing golf with kangaroos or things like that? Uh, I mean, there's some crazy stuff. The science behind it is they say that when you're asleep and around 90 minutes in, uh, your brain is constant uh, moving. We get to the REM sleep, the rapid eye motion. And your brain starts working and filtering things out. You will dream five times or so a night. Some of those last them five minutes to 20 minutes. Now in that dreaming in the subconscious state, God has chosen to speak to folks at times. So as I told you before last week that when it comes to dreams and visions, it is not the first word that God gives. It's always a second or third word. God has given this word. He spoke to us through his Bible, the word of God. And then God will speak at times through others. And he's speaking through a world leader named Nebuchadnezzar through dreams. It says he dreamed dreams. In other words, it was a continual thing. He had insomnia. Some people have trouble sleeping and it could be through a medical situation, pain, or just be through. And this was an insomnia that he's dreaming something he can't figure out. It's like he remembers bits and pieces, but he, he can't piece it together. I mean, this thing is startling. And he's dreaming the same thing multiple nights and multiple nights and multiple nights and multiple times. He is dreaming the same thing. And so he's wanting to answer. It said his spirit was troubled. And let me just say, if you're not right with God, that's a good place to be. <laughs> Your spirit being troubled. Unfortunately, we're living in a day where nothing much shakes us or troubles us. However, I have found out that when God starts honing in on someone, you can have some troubled spirit. Oh, happy day of the three-month insomnia that I was having back in 95 when God started arresting my soul. <laughs> And giving me sleepless nights. I don't know. You can take it to however you want it. But I was dreaming about death. Dying. I woke up with that on my mind. And here I was 19 years old. I'm thinking what is going on? <laughs> Why am I thinking those things? And through a process of hearing some preaching. And taking some counsel. And. And I'm glad I didn't have apps to get a hold of trying to figure this thing out. I'd have tried to figure this thing out and trying to seek different counsel and seeing that the Lord had opened my eyes and he was speaking to me. So here he's troubled. His sleep break from him. And so here we've got a king. He has everything. Remember, this is Nebuchadnezzar. This is the one that is the king of the whole world, basically, at this time. He's conquered a lot of things. He's a military genius. He's very wealthy. He's, his mindset is interesting. He's got anything that at this particular time that money could afford, but yet he's unhappy and he's troubled in spirit. See, some of you think what you need is to win the lottery. Instead of being a poor man north of Richmond, You're wanting to be a rich man south of Richmond. And maybe God will turn that around in your life. He can do that, as we can see. Now, God's wanting to do a deeper work in our lives. God's wanting to do something at a very deep level. And so he is moving on the scenes and he's taking this world leader. And now he's being shaken and troubled by dreaming some dreams. Then the king commanded, this thing so shook him that he called the magicians and the astrologers. That's what we're doing in America. We're calling on a bunch of psychics and a bunch of necromancing and trying to get astrologers. And last I read, 100 
and people read the horoscopes and you even know whatever. I had to read into some of that. I never got into it. You sort of know your animal or whatever it's called, your horoscope thing, and, and you're basing life on that. That astrology stuff. Can I say there's no answers in that? <laughs> You say, well, there's power and stuff. like Yeah, but it's a dark power. It's some satanic stuff. There's a greater power. There's a greater truth. And so he's seeking out and it's a limited knowledge. And see, so all of that is underneath the hospice of the kingdom of darkness or the devil. And the devil don't know the future. He knows as much as you and I do. And that's what God has revealed in the word. And so as these astrologers, these sorcerers or witches or witchcraft and... Uh, Warlocks, I done told you, you know, we done got the attention of those here. <laughs> uh, we had one leaving stuff here and she was coming and she was looking for us. And we call her on the camera and she's putting all type of spells and seances on the ground. You say, does that not scare you? No. <laughs> now, if I'm in my sin, that's the only power I know of. I'd be saying, what are we going to do? What about our t No, we got a greater power. We serve a resurrected God. <laughs> There is no war between God and the devil. He's a defeated foe. Or is God going to pull this thing out? God's already won. <laughs> the battle is in our minds, and that's where it takes place, where the enemy tries to come in and defeat the knowledge of God in your mind. There is no war between God and the devil. You can't fight the omniscient, the all-powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing's already over. His his you know, his future, his plot is settled. He knows that. Matter of fact, he don't even have a key to his own house where he'll live throughout eternity, which is the lake of fire. That's his plot. So he's going to, well, I'll try to take every one of those humans whom God used to usurp our authority. And that's the whole goal here. And so astrology, sorcery, witchcraft that is on the rise in America, if you do any student of history of studying missionaries, when I was teaching school for those 20 years and got into Christian history and started reading about the missionary that went to the East and went to various places where there was no Bible, no gospel, and they were caught up in all of the mysticism and warlocks and chants and witch doctors and all of that. This is nothing new. It's just invaded America. As America has dropped the Bible and said, hey, I think it'll be a good idea. Let's kick the Bible out of the schools in 1971. And how has that paired out for us? And so as now we're trying to seek answers because the future from circumstances looks bleak. And how are we going to tackle the future? If you're going to tackle the future, you better have a trust in God in the present. And a lot of times to trust God in the present, you got to tap into the past of the great things he's done. And God can do that in our lives. But if we're seeking astrologers, so let me just say, as your pastor, do not be reaching out to any psychic. You say, but I heard that the police department calls them and, and they get psychic Jane and psychic Jane was able to lead them to the bones of so-and-so. And then that gets out and it becomes all this craziness. Now, let me tell you this. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, let me, let me, give you this and make some sense out of it. Deuteronomy 18 and verses nine and following. <clears throat> Moses was taking Israel, the second law, and he's preparing them to go into the promised land where there was a bunch of pagans, pagan ideology. See, there was no God. We tried to figure out stuff. We're trying to figure out future. We're trying to figure out destiny, purpose, and life. And you get into all type of uh, craziness. And, and so in these pagan practices, in verse number nine, it says, when thou art coming to the land, which the Lord thy God, this is Deuteronomy 18, nine, that the Lord God has given thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you Anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Those are sacrifices in pagan practices. That passing through the fire was to give your children over uh, to these pagan temples. Not only just an execution and sacrifice, that was going on. But also to turn them over to become, uh, you know, temple prostitutes and everything that goes into there. It was basically child slavery uh, going on then, and it's going on at a higher rate now. 
And we need the sound of freedom in America. Thou shalt not be found among you any doing that, or that use divinations, or the observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, a charmer, a consulter with familiar spirits, those are psychics, that says I'm going to talk, and then it gets into uh, trying to figure out destiny to talk to those who have died. And it gets into a thing called wizards or necromancer. That's those who say they talk to the dead. And the word seeking out is that you're trying to find answers. We see a king of Israel sought out a witch to try to find destiny when they got away from God. Because when you can't hear from God, you're wanting answers. And I got to figure this thing out. And, and I heard that this psychic can read your palm and tarot cards and all that goes into there. So let me just say, with everything that's within me, you need to stay away from those practices because they're not of God and they're not of the kingdom of the light. It is the kingdom of darkness. This whole factionation of Ouija boards and all of that. You say, well, are you saying there's nothing real to it? No, I'm saying there is something real to it. You say that these warlocks and these wizards and these psychics, are they talking to dead people? They're not talking to dead people. You say, well, I've done that. And, and, they, and, and they were saying what my grandma would have said. <laughs> and I'm not making belittle of you wanting to talk to your loved one again. But the only way that's going to happen is if y'all two spend eternity in the same place. And if granny was a saved child of God, then you need to be a saved child of God. And you're going to see granny again. You're going to see Uncle Bob and mom and dad in the great reunion day and have conversations. However, when you get into the spirit world and spirits understands history cause they never die. And so angels who are fallen has become demons and demon spirits. And it seems to be that they understand history and that you can communicate in that spirit world as the Holy spirit can communicate with us. So can fallen spirits communicate with us. And when you give yourself over to that, you are talking. And if the right spirit begins to talk that knew your ground and knew some different things, can communicate things to you and deceive you. The number one thing that is going to be described right before Jesus comes is this thing called deception. That we're going to be deceived. There's going to be such a deception on the land that people's not even going to know if they're going to go right or left. And boy, is the enemy not doing that. What if it's in our political world? What if it's in our church world? You got churches that believe right. They can't even get along. And you got all this. So the devil's good at what he does in deceiving. This is an area of deceiving. There is power in it. It's touching into the unseen world. And the Bible says, do not call them in and seek those things out. An abomination. And so there's communication in the supernatural. But the question is, are you speaking that the Bible says when the person dies and leaves this world, that their fate is settled. They're going to heaven or they're going to hell. There they will be. There's no communicating with them. God done that. Matter of fact, I want to prove it. When Saul sought out a witch of Endor and he went there and said, okay. I want you to bring up Samuel who just recently died. Samuel was a prophet who spoke the words of God to Saul. But Saul disobeyed God. He would never trust God. He would never believe God. He just lived a life of disobedience. And Samuel said, God has done talking to you. And now Samuel's dead. And Saul can't find an answer for life. And so he's going to see, call Samuel up and see if he'll speak God back to me into my life. And he went and saw a witch to do that. But it was known where to find them. So they went to, now you just go to an app. And so he goes and goes to indoor.com and sucks up. And I want to talk to Samuel. And you know what happened? In this particular moment, only in this moment, God allowed Samuel to come on the scene and the witch startled her. She wasn't used to communicating that way. She was used to communicating with evil spirits. And at this point, God overrode that and said, all right, and brought Samuel up. And she screamed. <gasps> it got outside of that divination and enchantment and all of that uh, paganism. 
And Samuel had a word for Saul. And he didn't like that word, but it was true. Tomorrow, you will die. And that's what happened. Now, back to our story here and the truth of this, let me put out. Wizards, warlocks, all of those type of channeling is to be avoided. Seek God. You want answers? God has answers to these problems. Matter of fact, they don't even know it's, it's going into the occult and the dark world. And yes, it's growing in America. That doesn't mean that it's true. It just means we're living in a deceived, deceptive generation. And so, young people, there is something that you can lock on to to give you purpose. These young people found that Daniel, Azariah, Mishael found that. And so the king commanded, and he went to these guys and said, I want you wizards. And they were walking around with their necklaces and some makeup on their face to make them look even more, you know, authentic. <laughs> and uh, they were walking around looking like that. And he said, all right, boys, oh, you astrologers. You're walking around looking like death, talking to dead. Well, I'm going to give you something. If you can't tell me the meaning of my dream, you're all dying. And you can go see those people you're talking to. <laughs> that simple. And so the wizards and all said, hey, we can do that. Just tell us what your dream is. And then we'll make sense of it. And we'll tell you what it means. But Oneb, whether if he knew what he dreamed or just had bits and pieces... I think he knew what he was dreaming because it was multiple, but he chose not to tell them because if these guys could reveal what the dream was, then he was certain that they could reveal the right dream and interpretation to him. So he said, I'm not telling you that. You got to do two things. You got to tell me what I've been dreaming that's keeping me up all night for the last three months, or you're all going to die a few days from now. And they were like, we can't do that. That's crazy. Our powers is only so strong. You got to tell us, well, then you're all dying. And the word went out, kill them all. You're not doing me no good. Kill them all. See, God was revealing to Nebuchadnezzar some things too. That there is a greater power than these wizards and warlocks and charmers and Wicca. There's something that's greater than that. They're limited. They're talking with death. There is one that you can talk to. It's life. And so he's revealing that. Word gets out, comes to Daniel. And so as it comes to Daniel, and you'll see where he finds out, he goes. And Daniel, in verse number 14, Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom, Arioch, the captain, he's getting ready to mow them all down. He said, oh, hold off just one second, my man. <laughs> Don't kill us quite yet. Give me a day. And the God that reveals secrets will figure all this out. And then he left that meeting and went to his boys in verse number 13. He went to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. You see the conclusion of verse 17. Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah and these guys. Daniel and them boys must have been staying with him at his house. And they would desire mercies of the God of heaven. You want answers? Seek God in prayer. And they go to God in prayer and say, God, would you please show this? Because if not, we're all done. Verse 19, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. When God reveals stuff to you, you're going to walk around with a different perspective on life. All of a sudden, it's going to be, you know, instead of doom and gloom, everything's dying around us and everybody's going to die. And we're going to be part of that. It wasn't just good enough, God, that you took me out of my country and I'll never see my family again. But now you brought me here for a king to burn us all up. I'm going to go to you, God. God, turn this thing around. And God, in the night, come and showed him the truth. And he started blessing God. God and Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and the seasons. He moveth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth. With him, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, which has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast 
now made known unto us the king's matter. So God has revealed to Daniel what's going on. And when he had a right understanding of what's going on, you can go into life and face the challenges you're facing. When you got the right perspective of who God is, who you are. Daniel said, it's not in me. I can't do that. But there is a God that revealeth secrets. Go to prayer and seek him because he'll answer us. And when you're living with that understanding of who God is, who you are, you can go in and live a life with a surety, standing on the promises of God. So therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went to him and said unto him, destroy not anyone, take me to the king. And so the king went in and spoke to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, verse 26, whose name was Belshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream first and then the interpretation second? And Daniel answered into the presence of the king, the secret which the king had demanded, cannot the wise men? Well, he had to throw that in there. <laughs> Could the wizards not do it and the warlocks and all of the practices? They had all the money. They had all of the things. Could they not answer? But there is a God in heaven, verse number 28, that revealeth secrets and make it known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, the dream that you've dreamed and you're upon your bed is this. And he goes in and starts telling him a dream. Now, what his dream was, uh, is that statue, did I give you the statue on that slide? <clears throat> He's dreamed of a statue, a crazy looking statue of head of gold, comes down this arms of silver, and then it's got the thoracic region of, um, of bronze, and then it goes down into iron, and then iron mixed with clay. And that's just messing him up. And then at the end of the dream, he would see another stone that come out of a mountain that was not cut by human hands. It was just a big rock, a, 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 a bolter rock that come and destroyed that statue. And he was dreaming that every night. And it would just end with this thing exploding, it was just exploding up. And he'd wake up and, what is going on? Why am I dreaming this? And God's revealing to him. Now, I'm going to be breaking this down over the next little bit, and it'll make more sense if you'll stay with me through the next few months of a study in Daniel. Because what this is, is called the times of the Gentiles. And God is showing Nebuchadnezzar, number one, he's saying, when I'm going to reign, am I going to die, am I going to go this? And he's going to tell him, you're going to reign, you're going to reign about 70 years, and you're going to die. And the Babylonians are going to go down with it. And it's going to be overthrown by the Medio Persian Empire, and it'll be the Persians that will control. And he goes in and starts giving him. God put what the New Testament calls the times of the Gentiles and laid it out in an outline form of a statue. And the head of gold, more precious. And it started off with the Babylonians. There's a more precious metal working down the iron, which is a less costly metal, but more durable. In other words, when this thing ends, there's going to be an iron fist government that's going to control with great persecution on people. Nebuchadnezzar was gold. And if you, you know, as he brought them over, uh, he tried to immerse everyone into a climate, into a mindset, sort of like Hellenization of the Greeks. But to bypass this, I want to go more on that as he's laying out that this matters of fact, this interpretation in Daniel chapter seven is so accurate that people cannot believe that it was written when it was. They think that it was written post Jesus Christ, that it's so accurate in world history. Matter of fact, we call that prophecy. Let me give you three things that I want to leave you with practically. Number one, the future is unknown to us. We want to know the future, it's unknown. And what I mean by that is my personal world. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, uh, it's unknown, like, uh, Lord, who's going to be here? I don't know. Who, what's going to be next? Week? I don't know. Where am I going to be at a year from now? There's some things I'm glad I don't know. <laughs> but people want to dive in and know the future. We see that the best that they had in these wizards and warlocks because the devil, he doesn't know the future. So the future is unknown to us. And so you and I are living in a time 
And we're living in the present, not knowing what the future holds. So that can be a scary thing. And therefore, the enemy can put fear in our lives. It's called the spirit of fear. Second thing I want you to know as I look at this text, by way of practically, is the future is known by God. God does know the future. He's revealing the future. He reveals it out in things that's happened. That's called prophecy, where God reveals things yet to happen. Now, I'm going to tell you why God does that, why the future is revealed to us and why he does that. But let me give you just a few things. Let me just take you to a sign. So I, I had to go to people that, and there's a lot of them that's smarter than I am, but I use uh, Peter Stone and Dr. Hugh Ross. Dr. Peter Stone, he's got a book called uh, Science Speaks. Dr. Hugh Ross, is, his website you can look at is called Reasons to Believe. He's a Canadian astrophysicist. Like I can't even take level one, course one in a college to even get to astrophysics. <laughs> and this guy's a believer and he's, he loves numbers. And so when you punch in an equation, and the equation is this, the Bible was written over 1600 years. All right, over 1600 years by 40 plus authors three different continents, three different languages. And the fact that about one person throughout human history, most of the authors never knew each other, different cultures, different times, to, to make predictions about one man in history. And six, seven, eight hundred years later, those things come to true to detail the, you know, the probability and chances of that. I want to give you a little bit of that. Because see, we can first believe in Jesus because our parents told us. Well, it's just the right thing, you know, you believe in Jesus. But then there's going to come a time you're going to need more than that. I'm not just blindly following Jesus. Jesus wants us in the know. I'm not even going to get into historical evidence, archaeology evidence. I'm just going to get into a few prophecies that's laid out by these men. So when you use a formula to punch all of that information in for it to have. And there is over 300 prophecies about Jesus coming the first time. All right, so when Jesus came to Bethlehem, born there, the way he'd be born, the way he would live, the way he would die. 300 in the Old Testament tells about that event. All right, all of them come to pass. Let me give you some probabilities of that happening with just eight prophecies. Out of the 300, let's take eight. Punch it into the formula that these guys has done to have a probable cause. It's statistics. For eight of them, it's one in 10 and 27. 10 to the 27th power. You say, well, that's just a few numbers. So Hugh Ross and these guys say, well, let's do a what he calls a visual uh, visualization of chance or probability. With eight prophecies, 10 to the 27th power, for that to just happen, well, it's just a coincidence that eight of those was fulfilled in the life of one, 40 different authors, 1600 years, saying all these things and it fulfilling in the life of one person, just eight of them. To visualize that, if you take the state of Texas, cover it with quarters, mark one of them, and you cover the state of Texas two foot deep in quarters. You set a guy out, let him just parachute down. That wouldn't be me, but if you parachute down and the chances of you finding the one quarter that's marked is the chances of eight prophecies coming to fulfillment in Jesus's life. Number two, he stepped it up. As I'm reading Hugh Ross and some of these guys, it's getting in numbers. It's just really, it's, it's over my head, but they love playing in that. What about 48 of those prophecies? 48 of the 300 that was fulfilled in the life of Christ, where he would be born in Bethlehem. How he would be sold out for 30 pieces of silver. How he would die before crucifixion was even a thing. He would be pierced. His bones would not be broken. 48 of those. 
the visual of that, now this is getting into some stuff. It's going to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm just taking the astrophysics and some of this and just putting it in there. But of those 48, there's things, to, a quarter's too big to give the, the stats on that. You've got to go small. You ready to go small with me? Go microscopic? Go down to an electron. How big's an electron? Well, according to the astrophysicist, Dr. Hugh Ross, an electron, if you used to take a one-inch line, just a one-inch line, and stack electrons on that one-inch line to count the amount of electrons. By the way, the 48 is 10 to the 157th power. This is the illustration of that. It would, <laughs> if you was to count 250 electrons every minute for 24 hours a day, it would take you 19 million years to count the amount of electrons on the one-inch line. That's a lot of electrons. <laughs> If you was to take whatever amount that would be, after 19 million years of counting, 250 a minute every day, and to throw that amount of electrons into an open space, blindfold, turn around, and catch the electron that's been marked, is the chances of 48 prophecies being fulfilled in the life of one man. We're talking 300. <laughs> this is my... God has set this thing up, ladies and gentlemen, for do you reason he said the faith the size of a mustard seed to believe? And yet we believe far out fantastic stuff. We would rather choose to believe that because it takes human ability than to believe what God has already done and set up for us. And so as I think about that and the reason that God reveals truth, why is God revealing to Nebuchadnezzar, why is he revealing to Daniel these things? Why? Because at the end of the day, here's what Nebuchadnezzar says. Then the king answered and fell upon his face and worshiped uh, God Daniel and commanded that they should offer no obligation, sweet odors. And, and the king answered to Daniel of a truth that your God is the God of God and the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. God reveals stuff to us that you might believe. That you would know. I'm going to go. And the professor. Hugh Ross goes on and says. Any man who rejects Christ. As the son of God. Is rejecting a fact. Proved perhaps more absolutely. Than any other fact. In the world. But over the last 40 years of education. You think you got to be senile to believe that. That Darwinism is where it's at. And the probability cause of that is blows my mind. It literally blows my mind. Even before I was say, I was in sophomore taking this advanced bio two class. And I was hearing what Dr. Trebert was saying. She was down from Appalachian State and she was telling this stuff. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Minister was saying, that makes no sense. You're telling me that aliens planted life on this earth? through some type of laser mechanism 60 million years ago? Where'd the aliens come from? We don't know that. <laughs> We're just talking about this. <laughs> That's the craziest stuff. And people buy into that. When we got a God who's revealed himself in such a way that the size of a mustard seed faith would change the world and your life if we just believe him and surrender to it. And so as this is concluding out, God's coming to a conclusion of telling and revealing. God reveals things and shows things to set the stage where you can just trust him. That we serve a God who's aligned everything up that you will believe that his son is the Christ, the son of of the living God. Why would God set the stage for humanity? Because he knows the fallen nature. He knows our minds. He knows our logic. God wants all of that. God's not scared of your questions. He's not scared of, you say, what about it? you relative? I'm so relative. It ain't even matter because God said, come now, let us reason together, which is logic. And it is rational for me to believe in who Jesus was. It's irrational for me to buy in to, we've already seen falsified evidence of Darwin's model. And they didn't even have microscopes then. And kids know this. Charles Darwin wasn't a scientist. He was a theologian. He was a theologian. 
who got on a, a boat called the Beagle and started going around seeing the evil practice of slavery and said, how could a good God let bad things happen? And he couldn't answer that question. And so he dove in to seeing the different types of beaks of a finch and come up with the whole complexity of life. And we bought that in America. And you tell me Satan's not good at deception. No, you are valued. You're a prized possession. You've been created by God and God's got an awesome plan for your life. And if you're here and you say, but I don't feel like I'm in it because you need to trust him who can turn the situation around in your life and set it on the right course with a holy God. We serve that type of God. We serve a God that's in full control. And, and yet I wrestle because sometimes maybe I think too much. I wrestle. I know the outline. I know we win in the end. And sometimes the devil will come in and in my own personal life. And you need stuff turned around. And sometimes it don't happen the way you think it should happen. And all of a sudden I can let things come in and start discouraging me in this. But I need to tap in that we serve a God who not only cares about the big things and on the world stage in the time of the Gentiles, but they also come in and said, hey guys, I care about the very number of hairs that's on your head that falls. <laughs> and I'm so working in your life that you see all of these sparrows and how they're you know, covered and you've seen how Solomon was this. Solomon was nothing the way I can supply your needs. We serve a God that we can give it over to. We can give all of our insecurities, our dysfunctions, our questions, our distractions, our frustrations. We can give it all to him and trust him. And I'm going to leave you with a statement um, from one of the great ladies in history. <clears throat> Her name's Corey Ten Boom. For some of you who don't know who she is. She was born in the Netherlands. Her dad was a watchmaker. She became uh, the first certified watchmaker, woman watchmaker in the Netherlands. I mean, just, she'd just done great things. She was very good at making watches well. Showing up one day was this lady well-dressed, and she was like, they just took my husband and arrested him, and they're coming after me. Could you help me, please? She was a Jewish lady. At this time, Adolf Hitler who, by the way, silenced in the 1920s, started silencing everybody that opposed him, cutting off their feeds and having any opposing view. And as he started silencing all there and he took control, and that's how 10% of the population in Germany, which was the Nazis, could take control of the whole country by silencing opposing voices. And so when he did that and he became the Fuhrer, he started feeding on with the young people and giving them a taste of some things. And, and he started invading nations. And here come Nazis just going around and just the concentration camps that he had built. And he started targeting the Jews. Well, Corey Ten Boone, her family was part of what they called the, the Calvinist Reformed. And they read the Old Testament. And she looked at her and said, you're part of God's people and we'll hide you. They had an architect to come in and make a room in their house that could hide about six people. It was known as the hiding place. She began to hide multiple, I think around 800 and all, that she was able to, to help and save. Well, sure as it is, you always think you got people that's on your side. <laughs> we don't know nothing about that, do we? And then they turn and somebody rattled her out in the family. We know some people hiding them Jews. And here come the Gestapo. The Gestapo comes and says, we've been here and y'all hiding. They arrested everybody in the house. There was 30 of them. The six Jews that was there was able to hide during the whole process. They never got caught. She and her sisters and mom and dad was taken to concentration camps. Unknown what the future looks like. They're gassing folks. They're taking... She was in uh, Gavinston uh, concentration camp, an all woman's camp. They come to her one day and said, uh, Miss Corey Tim Boone, you're being released. There was some type of 
they don't even know how it happened. <laughs> a typo within the thing and got her, she got out and her whole unit was actually taken to the gas chambers the very next week and every one of them was executed. She makes a statement in her book. She said, during that time, I didn't know if I was going to live the next day or not. I was able to do it and be a voice of hope in such a dark place. Because she said, even though all of our futures was unknown, I put all of that into a known God. So let me just say, we may not know what tomorrow holds, but we do know who holds tomorrow. And with that information and you're here and you have never just given yourself over to a known God, would you trust him this morning? Trust him with your life. If you've never been saved, trust him. He is who he said he is. It's a simple God. I, I realize my problem. It's not everyone else. It's my sin. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Thank you for coming and dying in my place. If you need God to turn your little world circumstance, you've done that, but you've gotten away from the Lord. And you, got, you need God to come in and turn some things around. Matter of fact, group, come on up here. I'm going to ask them to come back up and sing a little bit of that. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed. Now, Lord, we thank you for your truth this morning. <clears throat> and you're a God that we can trust. And sometimes when our present just seems to be rocky and a lot of things going on, it makes us uncomfortable about the future. Would you help us tap into the past? We thank you, God. We love you. Would you turn things around in our life? Help us quit doing the same old thing. Help turn some stuff around that we need in our life. And God, it starts with that first commitment to follow you. There's one here that's struggling. They're struggling with the whole God thing, the whole church thing, the whole, and they're just struggling. God, may they come to you with their struggles, with their questions. We're gonna see that you're gonna have the best logical answers. So would you turn our situations around this morning? In Jesus' name, amen.